In this video, we are going to go over how to use the simplex volume maximization method to do multiple energy data analysis. Uh, we can use this in multiple ways uh, with elemental data uh, collected from different ROIs on full MCA spectra. Uh, but the application we're going to show today is for looking at N members in multiple energy data maps. Now, the first thing I want to do is quickly put up a little slide about what the uh, method is doing. Um, I've heard it called both simplex volume maximization and simplex volume minimization. But regardless, it's a geometric analysis that's used to find N members in your data set. Um, it's basically a non-negative matrix factorization and it's using the actual data set values to actually find those M members rather than a mathematical abstraction. Um, because it's a geometric method, it's computationally very quick. So this is very good for large hyperspectral, hypercube type data sets, which is often what we're using in XRF image analysis. Um, so in a simple sense, if you imagine this uh, example here is a two dimensional data set, uh, we basically are finding the first two points that are the furthest away from each other. And when we add extra N members on, we are finding N members that are then trying to maximize the volume covered by the area enclosed within those N member sets or minimize what's not being included. Um, either way, um, you can think about it just the same. Uh, the one thing you want to always make sure is that you are not including noise in this process as well. So usually in the algorithm, there is a cutoff. So if your average, if your signal is less than some fraction of an average, it'll ignore it. Um, anything else, uh, we want to keep the intense signals uh, as part of the data process. Now, an important thing, though, is to make sure that we don't uh, are not too aggressive in this uh, data noise reduction, because otherwise we might be losing uh, low concentration parts of the sample that are still important. Okay, so let's get rid of that. And now let's go look at some data. Uh, here in the microanalysis toolkit, we are going to open, I'm going to start by opening the low energy uh, file here. So this is the lowest one. And here we go. Okay. We look at the sulfur distribution here, uh, we see that there is some sulfur there, as we might expect. Uh, this is actually a, a natural sample of a lapis mineral, a lapis lazuli, that has lapis and pyrite and a bunch of the other accessory minerals present there as well. The next thing we need to do now is to load all of the other data files into the data set. Uh, so we're going to go to File and Rapid Import From. I'm going to select the rest of our data sets. There we go. Open them all up. And we are going to import the sulfur channel from each of these data sets. Click, click, click. And now we can come to the bottom. We've appended the energy to all of those, and we can step through and see the data. Now notice that in this particular set, uh, in 2475, there's a error in the data collection here. So we had an extra pixel and it's been shifted that over. It's shifted that over. Um, so when we actually do our analysis, rather than doing it on the entire data set, we're only going to analyze the left-hand set. Uh, there are some corrections that we can do, and we'll go over that in a, one of the other videos in this section. But for uh, the purpose of time here, we are just going to go and we're going to zoom into this section right here. Just miss that abnormal bit, and now bring the window up here. So now we have the pyrite, another pyrite here, we believe, and a bunch of the other lapis portions. Okay. Now, the next step is we are going to, we've looked at all the data there. Uh, what I want to be able to do, though, is when I look at this in the um, uh, SIVM method, I want to know the actual energies that are being used here. So under Analyze, I'm going to go to Spectrum Maker. And I'm going to select the channels that are my primary data channels. Here we go. And it asks me what the first value is. Is it 2469? It's like, well, it's close, but I want to be more specific. No. 
don't want to enter a constant energy step range. So if you had a large number of files, you could enter in a constant one rather than editing every single one. I'm not doing that either. It tries to guess, but it doesn't do a very good job with the fractions after the EV. So we're going to manually enter these. Uh, luckily, there's not a thousand of these. And the last two is fine, and this one is that one. And I can always check to make sure I'm right by if I double click. In addition to getting the X and Y coordinates, I get the spectrum at every particular point. So that looks like you know, it has a lot of sulfate and some of our low Z portions here. And then or if I click over here, you see that's what this looks like the pyrite spectrum. So um, it does work. Fantastic. Okay, so we'll end the spectrum plot, plot view. Um, so I also want to help increase my some of my signal to noise here. So I'm going to do the blurring method. I'm going to go to process and advanced filtering. And now I'm going to select my, my first file here. And we're going to apply a Gaussian blur. That's the blur function here. I tend to like to use a 5 by 5 kernel. So it's going to average the data from the 25 points around it. If I was to do this in a mean mode, it would be a pretty harsh blurring. You'd lose a lot of spatial resolution. But by applying, applying a Gaussian and say a non-aggressive uh, full width half max, so we're only going to average say 0.6 pixels full width half max into our data, I still maintain a lot more of the actual data definition spatially, but I'm still improving some signal to noise. And that's our goal here. And now I can highlight all the channels and have it save all those. And it goes through and does that process for us. We are all done. So now we have new channels here that are nicely blurred. There we go. Now actually what I want to do again here is I'm going to go to the Spectrum Maker one more time and have it deal with these channels so that when we actually process these channels, it'll come up properly. Um, so we'll do this one more time. Go. Again, luckily we don't have a ton of these. Okay, there we are. So now we're going to perform our analysis on these blurred and average channels. We go to the PCA analysis and we are going to scroll down and find our blurred channels. And we tell to do the simplex volume maximization method. Uh, we have to give it the number of end members we want to look for. It by default brings up the number of channels, so six. Uh, you can go higher. It doesn't make sense to go too much lower. Uh, usually at the worst case, what you're going to find is you'll find another channel and the two channels are redundant and you'll have to add those together. So we'll stick with six for right now. And now we have that noise level reduction factor. So this is the, let's look at the mean intensity and anything that's less than, in this case, 1% 1, one uh, times the mean, it'll re remove. Uh, so usually we want to go much less than that. I'm going to do 10% of the average intensity. So I'm going to keep things that are 10% above the noise, basically. And we'll hit OK. It will do the SIBA method, and there you go. Um, whenever we do any of these PCA type methods, it always pops up a box with the uh, actual component vectors there. Uh, if you notice compared to maybe a PCA method, these actually look like real spectra, and that's because they actually are real spectra. They are actually coming from the specimen itself. So they are real spectra from different from those locations. And because these come from real spectra, we also have now po automatically populated the plot marker window with the location of these spectra. And so, unfortunately, here it's labeled 0 through 5, and it's 1 through 6 here. So that very first eigenvector 0 is this one here, which is located right there, and so on and so forth. So you can see there's actually some very interesting little differences. Um, this one here looks very pyrite-like, too, in number 2, wherever number 2 is. Uh, I'm going to bet that 2 is over here somewhere. Uh, we can always change all to default. Yep, and two is in that little corner right there. There we go. And we can go back to set all the text. Yep, it's hiding right there. So it has this envelope here and very little sulfate. 
And we can see here there in our different lapis sections, we have different intensities in this 2469. So that's the blue part of lapis and different envelopes here in the uh, file, files and other portions here. So there's some actually interesting chemistry going on in this natural rock as well. Well, let's see how that looks spatially. I'm gonna hide this part here. And in addition to the spectra being our end members in those locations, it's now done a non-negative fit to the rest of the area. And we'll now be able to see where those are distributed in the sample. So if I look at component one, this is now picking up this background, not in the lapis, not in the pyrite region. Component two is picking up our pyrite here. Component three is picking up this portion of the lapis very nicely. Even though it's picking it, the spectrum from over here, it is really doing it. Um, it's still represented in many different areas. Uh, four is this one here. So it's picking up a slightly different distribution. We can compare that again. There's some streaks in this one where this one is more consistent. And we see another set of uh, streaky data in this set here. So this is actually some very interesting distribution. And six is even more striking. So we have a bunch of different mineralogies of different, slightly different sulfur chemistry that is occurring within the bulk of the blue lapis here. And it's got a very interesting texture. When you see this kind of texture, you really don't assume that it's uh, artifact anymore because it actually has adjacent uh, bit pixels that are very similar to it. So it's actually picking up a real structural change. Um, and this is a, a pretty uh, exciting uh, result. Uh, we can even go to our tricolor plots here, for instance, and see how this looks together. Um, I'm going to make uh, component six, which is this streaky one, into red. And let's see, I think we want to try four being green. And we have our background, we can make that blue. Actually make yeah that's the one I wanted that's component three yeah let's see oops it's gone away oh, I bet it is right here there we go and so here now we can see that background and these two different portions of uh, streaky lapis all in the same plot here. Um, this gives a really interesting dynamic and this now really gives you some ideas to explore with spectroscopy. We really want to get some really good resolution in this area here versus that area there to really study the full chemistry of the um, peaks that we see down here. Um, and this has been a really good way now to uh, guide our data collection um, in, in the future of this. And this is something that we wouldn't have normally expected because the sample looked all homogenous from a lot of the sulfur uh, compositions originally, but has a lot of chemical texture within it. Um, so it's a very exciting uh, uh, bit to start with on the next part of the analysis for the sample. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to see how this is yet another technique to look and parse your energy data and help you break out and find chemical end members uh, and guidance for both as further analysis and for data collection at the BMO. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thank you.